fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let's pray. We thank you, O God, that you have again brought us together on the Lord's day to praise you for your goodness and to ask your blessing. Give us grace to see your hand in the week that is past and your purpose in the week to come. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Special greetings to those that are joining us through Facebook or later through YouTube. We pray that you would find encouragement and sustenance in this service of prayer this morning. I'll also mention that we hope to see many of you out well, through the computer at 5 o'clock this evening as we prepare to share a dinner of sorts within the parish via Zoom. So that's tonight at 5 using our coffee hour and social Zoom coordinates. If you need any assistance, don't hesitate to contact myself or Father Jared. And a reminder that uh, the uglier the, the seasonal sweater, the better it is for the purposes of this dinner. So now let us turn to our Lord as we continue our journey through Advent. We recall these words of the baptizer. A voice cries out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. So let us listen and turn to the Lord in penitence and faith. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left among them. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Merciful God, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. to the captives and release to the prisoners, to 
proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let our voices spring up as we say with Mary, the Magnificat. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in you, O God, my Savior. For you have looked with favor on your holy servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. You, the Almighty, have done great things for me, and holy is your name. Your mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You have shown strength with your arm, and scattered the proud in their conceit, casting down the mighty from their thrones, and lifting up the lowly. You have filled the hungry with good things, and sent the rich away empty. You have come to the help of your servant Israel, for you have remembered your promise of mercy. The promise made to our forebears, to Abraham and the children of Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and will be forever. A reading from the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 5, beginning at the 16th verse. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful. And he will do this. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My soul waits for the Lord. In God's word is my hope. My, my soul, soul waits for the Lord. In God's, God's word is my hope. Out of the depths have I called to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. In God's, God's word is my hope. hope. There is forgiveness with you, therefore you shall be few. In, In God's, God's word is my hope. 
My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. In God's word is my hope. O Israel, wait for the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy. In God's word is my hope. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. My soul waits for the Lord. In God's word is my hope. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you a prophet? Are you the prophet? He answered. He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one who you do not know, the one who is coming after you. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The Gospel of Christ.
God, may only your word be spoken, only your word be heard. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Beloved in Christ, we are almost there. Advent 3, Mary's Sunday. Our eyes shift to a different color from blue to pink, the color of joy. We have arrived at Mary's Sunday and we stand on the threshold, the threshold of the manger, the threshold of the cradle of our redemption draws near. We are almost there. This past week, we had our granddaughter, Adelaide, who's five years old, with us. We were sitting at the lunch table. She has recently joined the children's choir in her church. She was, as she was eating her lunch, singing away a song, this week's song that she has learned. And it was Mary's song. It was the Magnificat. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Her soft voice ran across the lunch table. When she was finished singing, I said to her, Addie, what does the word joy mean to you? She didn't hesitate. Not at all. And with her body and her words, she answered right away. She sat up very straight and looked at me. And she said, but Grandma, Grandma, joy is when you're filled up with Jesus. She touched from her heart to her throat. Joy is when you are filled up with Jesus. I imagine Mary, all those many years ago, would have understood what Adelaide was trying to to express, filled up with God, filled up with Jesus. As she, a lowly young woman from a place of no account, was summoned through the voice of an angel to be the servant of God in a way which would change everything, which would turn the world upside down through the birth of a Savior, the birth of God coming into human flesh, I'm sure she understood what I meant. Joy is to be filled up with Jesus. And yet this week I was very aware, even as we hold the image of Mary in front of us, the perhaps most poignant image, mother and child of this season, which communicates everything we know and understand about hope and possibility and the new day that is dawning in God, that image of mother and child, the epitome, not just in our culture, but around the world, in every culture, the image is of hope, of possibility, of beauty, of goodness, of joy. Even as I held that image ahead of me, preparing for Advent 3, I was very aware there are other images of mother and child which stand with us in this Advent season. You may have read an editorial in the Kitchener Record this week. It was written by David Beasley. David Beasley is the president of the World Food Program of the United Nations. The article is a very disturbing piece talking about the impact of COVID on the hunger situation around the world, how interruption of supply chains and other factors are actually greatly uh, increasing the food security problem for the world. And as we face toward 2021, he writes, we are looking at a world of food loss and epidemic, the addition of tens of millions of more borderline starvation humans in this globe with us in a way that we haven't for many decades. It was a very disturbing global picture, but it, it was not the big picture that most disconcerted me in this week of Advent 3. It was the micro image he left in the article. He said, that the food insecurity issues of our world are disproportionately affecting young women and their young children. He said, imagine for a moment that you take all of the very food insecure, the very, very hungry people of the world, and you put them into one room. He said, then you open the door and you look in that room and what do you see? You see a young woman with her young child, mother and child. That image set beside the image of Mary and the birth of joy in us, which is coming 
in that cradle of our redemption, those images together disturbed me all week. Toward the end of the week, another image entered into that conversation. I'd like you to, to imagine with me for a moment, to, to imagine a third image. It's December 15th, 1963. The place is a maternity ward in a small Salvation Army hospital in downtown Toronto. Lying on the delivery bed is a young girl, 15 years old, just turned 15. She's giving birth to her first child, a daughter. After the child is born, she has no one with her, only the medical professionals. The nurse holds the baby for a moment for her to see, as was the custom of the day, she was not to hold the baby. She saw the baby for a moment, and then that baby was taken away. That young mother, she went on her way to live her story, and the baby, I, was on my way to live my story. The three images, the room of the hungry, Mary with Jesus, and December 15, 1963, those images stayed with me all week, and a, a question came to me. Do you know I never knew what the day of the week was that I was born, so I decided I would Google. What day of the week was December 15th, 1963? So I did, and guess what? December 15th, 1963 was a Sunday. In fact, it was Advent 3. Well, all of a sudden, those story images collapsed into one. And I saw, I believe, what God was inviting me to see. As I considered the suffering and the joy of my own story, I saw for a moment what Mary must have seen. That these two images, the image of Mary, the mother of joy, possibility, redemption, and hope, and the mother and her child who are hungry, they belong together. They are not opposites. They are two sides of the same story when seen with the gospel lens. They belong together. Mary knew this. We heard that as she expresses through the pen of the writer of the Gospel of Luke. She expresses her heart. She knows these two images belong together. For she who is lowly has been raised up. And she talks about how these two images, this great hope which is coming, the redemption of everything, the reconciliation of it all, how it sits with this story of, of oppression and injustice and lack about the relationship by naming the intention of God. She says it very clearly. The lowly will be raised up. The mighty arm of God will make it so. Our God is breaking into history to turn this story of loss into a story of healing, reconciliation, and joy. These two stories live together, defining for us the intention of God in Jesus for us in this world. It wasn't just Mary in today's reading who tries to express this truth for us. Did you see the writer of the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah? He's very clear. Oh, I've got some good news for you today. When the Messiah comes, God will break in. And by the strength of his arm, by the strength of his arm, our God who loves justice, so says Isaiah, our Lord loves justice. Those who are on the bottom, pressed down, will be raised up. By the strength of God's arm, those who are lost will be found. Those who are captives will be freed. Those who are brokenhearted will be healed. Those who mourn will be comforted. The year of the Lord's favor is here in this Messiah that is coming, says the prophet Isaiah. The two sides of the same story, they are about the intention of God, the saving work of God in history for us, in us, and with us that changes everything. Paul is not to be left out. In his letter to the Thessalonians, he gives us what is perhaps one of the most famous tropes of spiritual practice in the entire New Testament. Did you hear him? He says really clearly, he says, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. 
give thanks in all circumstances. Do you hear him? He has caught the vision of Mary's wisdom, of Isaiah's promise, and the work of God in history. I'm always puzzled about this phrase. What do you mean? Rejoice. Look at how crummy the world is. Look at all of those women and children behind that door. How can I rejoice? How can I pray with gratitude in all circumstances? But this meaning, this Christmas meaning towards which we are moving, tells us how, and Paul knows this. We can rejoice in all things. We may pray without ceasing. We may have gratitude in all circumstances, not for all circumstances, in all circumstances, because God is in them with us. O come, O come, Emmanuel, God with us. And because of that, we are changed. And when one person is changed, everything is changed. This season of the Incarnation, the Holy One, the source of our being, graces all that is broken, all that is low, all those who are pressed down, all of us who is and are all of us who suffer by entering into the story through the cradle of our redemption in the presence of a baby. Innocence will be our DNA. God reaching into this broken fabric of everything and by the strength of his arm in the birth of that fragile, helpless child, God reaches in and turns it all upside down and Mary sings for joy. Joy is when we are built up Two sides of the same coin. One, one last image is from Charles Dickens. <coughs> I don't know if you love Charles Dickens, but I do. Charles Dickens' writing creates worlds of imagination which are beautiful. And in his Christmas carol, he puts this one line in the mouth of the narrator, which stays with me probably the first time I heard it as a child. He says about this season, he says, Christmas time, Christmas season is the time when want is most keenly felt and abundance rejoices. When he wrote that, I think he was trying to create a black and white world and us and them. There are those who want, there are those who have. But when we look at this story through the eyes of Mary, through the eyes of Isaiah, with the eyes of Paul, in witness to the gospel narrative, we see, oh, it isn't us and them. It is us. Everything is one in Christ. The young woman and her child, blessed in a manger, the young woman and her child in the room of the hungry it is one. When one of us wants, we all want. When one of us rejoices, we all rejoice. We are all changed in joy by the power of our communion in Jesus. God breaks in the history to lift us up, to heal us and bring us home. Person, the child. Joy is when we are built up with Jesus. Our Advent work then, as we stand on the threshold, is to take just one step closer. One step closer to that manger, to that door, and together taking that step as the body of Christ, together risking opening the door and encountering what is there, which is our redemption in a manger. It is also a woman and a child who are hungry. They are both there in that manger, summoning us to live the witness of joy, which the incarnation is, the incarnation which is the breaking in by a God who loves justice. We are invited to step closer to that transfigurative light of the manger, see all that is there with hearts, eyes, and minds open and be changed. We will not all die, but we will all be changed. And as we are changed, so too the world. O oh come, O oh come, Emmanuel.
as a symbol of our togetherness in walking toward God's promised future, let's confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father of Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and the glory of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Amen. Maria, 
Iris, Nevin, Ilya, Anastasia, Rosiah and family, Marilyn, Perry, Luke, Judy, and all of those on our hearts. In your mercy, prepare us for Lord.
be prepared to go forth into the world, I'll just note that, uh, as you may have read in the recent parish email, that we anticipate uh, Jody Hall's birthday this week. We have learned today, and we give much thanks for your sermon today, Wendy. We, we learned of your upcoming birthday, and we wish God's blessings upon you. And we are so thankful that your story, and the story of our parish, and the story of us, have come together. We're truly thankful for that. So, let us go in God's peace and with God's blessing. May Almighty God, by whose providence our Savior Christ came among us in great humility, sanctify you with the light of his blessing, and set you free from all sin. Amen. Amen. May he whose second coming in power and great glory we await make you steadfast in faith, joyful, joyful in hope, and constant in love. Amen. Amen. And may you who rejoice in the first advent of our Redeemer, at his second advent, be rewarded with fullness of life. Amen. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and with all those whom you love, this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Let us go in peace.